الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and controller of all that happens in the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, the weather is really beautiful outside. I know that. Um, and inshallah, it will remain like this for the next couple of days. It's not too hot, not too cold, just at the right temperature. Now at this point in time, in terms of the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, we are at the point where the first revelation would come down to him. And we know from the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari that as he got older, the Prophet والسلام, as he got older, he began to think more and more deeply about the society and the direction that the society was heading in in terms of the various trends that were considered normal and acceptable in society. But as it got closer to the time that revelation would come to him, two things begin uh, started happening to him. Number one, he started to have dreams. In the hadith in Bukhari, they described as a ru'ya sadiqa, true dreams. Meaning that he would have a dream and what he saw in the dream would come to pass in the near future. And this was all, of course, this was supposed to make him realize that something strange is happening. He might not have understood exactly what would happen to him in terms of receiving revelation from God Almighty, but at the very least, he won't be caught completely off guard. He would have some idea that, you know, things are strange. This is strange. In addition to that, as he got older, he also, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, in this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, she said, الخلق, that Allah caused him to begin to love to just be alone by himself, away from the people. So, Maybe a year or less than a year before he received revelation, what he would do alayhi salam was to take some food and water with him and he went up to a cave that was well known to the people, the Arabs at the time who lived in Mecca. The cave, the cave that is known as Hira, Gharu Hira, on top of a mountain that is now known as the Mountain of Light. In those days, the mountain was not known as the Mountain of Light, Jabal al it only got the name after the revelation came to the Prophet ﷺ, the first revelation on that mountain. So he would go up there and he would be alone and he would think and ponder and wonder about the trends in society and what could he possibly do. Uh, as I've mentioned in the past, the Prophet ﷺ knew that many of the trends and the habits in society were wrong. He just had no idea how to go about changing these things. It seemed like a daunting task. Like, how do you get a people to give up alcohol? In our country today, although alcohol is permitted, but there's restrictions, there are laws that would oblige a person not to drink and drive, for example. We have laws about that. And yet, many people don't obey the law. So how do you get people to give up alcohol? When we have laws that restrict it, it doesn't uh, prohibit it uh, completely. It's just restricted, and yet people find it hard to abide by these restrictions. Many people still drink and drive and, and whatever else. So he didn't have the answers. He knew it was wrong. He wished he could change it, but he had no knowledge of what to do and how to do it. So, and this he would do for a while. He would take his food and water for a couple of days, 
And then when it ran out, he would come back down and go home to Khadija radiallahu anha and take some more and go back up. So for the last maybe six or eight months of his life, this was basically what he was obsessed with as we say. Just going up there and thinking and pondering and wondering and trying to get ideas if you like. And then suddenly one night it happened. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about the significance of the first revelation. Just remember, things are just normal, ordinary, and suddenly one night this revelation comes and the next thing we know, everything changed. So what exactly is the significance of the first revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam? First of all, it is actually the greatest gift that Allah would give to mankind. How? How is it the greatest gift? Because it is revelation. And this revelation, as we all know, was given not only to the Arabs but to all of mankind. So it is a gift to all of mankind. But it is the greatest gift because it seeks to take people out of darkness into light. It seeks to take people out of darkness into light. Plus, in the Sharia of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed his favors on, on mankind and perfected religion for them. So there are no more favors that are missing from mankind and there is no more improvement per se uh, in terms of religion. And this is highlighted in the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah which came down to the Prophet والسلام, at the very end almost of his life. He was in Hajj in the 10th year of prophethood. Uh, sorry, in the 10th year after the Hijrah. In Hajj which is the last year, uh, last month of the year and in Rabi'in al-Awwal of the next year, he would die. So roughly about three months before he died, he's in Hajj. And this verse was revealed to him. When Allah says, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, wa radhitu lakum al-Islam deen. In this, in this, actually this is only half of the verse. The last half. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three, three things. He says, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum." On this day, that is the day when this verse was revealed, I have perfected for you your religion. So there is no more adding to the religion. There is no more changing of the rules of the religion. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah in his tafsir said that what it means is, as of this day, whatever was halal remained halal and whatever was haram remained haram. No new haram and halal were revealed. It was uh, akmala, yani, uh, perfected. And once it's perfected, there is nothing more to add to, to make it better or to perfect it. It's already perfect. In fact, if something is perfect, you can't really make it more perfect. You see, the perfect are not perfect. So you can't make it more perfect. That's like a, an oxymoron. Um, so that's the first thing Allah says. That today I have perfected for you your religion. And of course the term perfection also implies excellence. So not only there are no more new rules to come. But this religion is also the best or most excellent religion for mankind. That's what it means. The second thing is Allah says, وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And I have completed my favors upon you. So there are no more favors that Allah needs to grant to people in terms of ease in religion. He has given everything that needed to be given. And thirdly, Allah says, وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Now, let me ask the brothers and sisters, anyone knows the translation of this last part? You must have heard this verse, haven't you? Have you heard this verse? What is the last part there? This day I have perfected for you your religion, and I have completed my favors upon you, and I have what? What's the last part? 
I want the English translation. Did you say the Arabic again? The Arabic is Waradi to Lakumul Islam Adinan. I have chosen Islam for you as your religion. The translation says chosen. But the word radi to radiya means not just to choose but to be pleased with. And I think that's missing from the translation chosen. So Allah says not only I have chosen this but I am pleased with this as a, as a way of life for you. Deen and here means way of life. Interesting. Allah says, I am pleased with this as your way of life. This way of life that Allah perfected and completed all his favors. So, with the very first revelation of the Quran to the Prophet, I mean, the whole Quran is this gift to mankind, the greatest gift. But the first revelation was the first part of this greatest gift that Allah would now give, give to mankind. And the revelation is considered the greatest gift because it will take a person who believes in it and follows it out of darkness into light. And as a result, the life of that individual will improve greatly. It is also the first mercy that Allah would show to mankind after, of course, uh, 600 years when Isa salam was sent. Because once he was raised up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people of course with time began to deviate and they received no more guidance from Allah. That is no more mercy from Allah till the sending of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It also marked the transformation of Muhammad from being an ordinary, regular person into now being a prophet and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it raised and elevated his status and gave him what we call the highest office anyone can hold in this life. These days, people say the highest office, what is the highest office in any country? What is the highest office you can hold in Canada? Sorry? Being the Prime Minister, exactly. In the Islamic perspective, the greatest office is being a messenger or a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, no one can ascend to that level unless that person is chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not something you can run you can run in elections for. You can run in elections to become the prime minister. But to be a prophet, there are no elections for that. It is God Himself who chooses. And He doesn't need to have elections because Allah knows what's best. And he always chooses the best person among a people to be their prophet and messenger. So that he is the best example and model for them, and so that they cannot point fingers at him. In addition to that, this first revelation also ushered in the age of education. The age of education. It marked the end of ignorance. It marked the end of ignorance. In fact, as we will see, insha'Allah, the message of these first five verses deal primarily with the issue and concept of learning and education. And so these verses are like the mission statement of Islam. You know, every time an organization is established, they have a vision and they have a mission statement. Your vision is what you want to accomplish. Your objectives, more or less. Where you want to end up in a few years from now. Your mission statement is what you're about. So the mission statement is like this vehicle. And so the first revelation is like the mission statement of Islam, of this new religion or way of life that would come on the scene. And that is that the way of life of Islam is based or would be based on learning and education, not ignorance, not guesswork, learning. Because with learning, doors are going to be opened. 
And the learning doesn't have to be religious alone. See, many of us, when we hear Islamic education, we think of religious instruction. We think of madrasas where you learn to read the Quran and you learn Tajweed and you learn Hadith and you do Tafsir and you might do Fiqh and so on. But this is religious instruction. It is only half or part of Islamic education. The other half is academic learning. Academic learning is not just secular learning. <coughs> It is also part of Islamic learning. And that's why in the Muslim countries, they have a combination of both. As you go through primary and high school, on the university you can uh, specialize. You can do Islamic studies specifically or you can do academics. But up until high school, you actually combine both components of, of, of learning, religious as well as academic. Now, the first revelation actually proves that Islamic education is not only religious instruction, but also academic instruction. It is also that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read. And reading here really means learn. Its implication is learn. Because reading is one of the most important ways of learning. It's not the only way of learning. There are other ways of learning, of course. But it's one of the most important. And widespread. Allah says read, but He says read in the name of your Lord. Right? So the connection with Allah the Creator. Which could be interpreted as what? As religious. Because people tend to think of anything that has God in it as religious. And that's why Islam seeks to combine what we call religion and state. In uh, all the non-Muslim countries, their efforts are directed towards separating the two. So they talk about secular states. That religion is more of a private thing you practice at home. It shouldn't even be public. And that's why recently there are some countries like France that have taken steps to ban religious symbols in public. Yeah, right. right? With the diqab and so on. Anyways, but Islam seeks to combine both because in the revelation that Allah gave in this message, Allah shows us that it's possible to combine both. Want me to use this as well? All right. You don't have a stand that I could rest this on. Uh, we're trying to find it. Alright, that's okay. So in these verses, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the value of education and learning. Now to even give us a better understanding and appreciation of how important and valuable education is, we need to consider the context or the background. So I want you to picture with me this scenario. If you were sending a messenger to another city, let's say, chances are you would give your messenger a letter of introduction, right? You'll write a letter of introduction to the people of that city. But what, what might you write in that letter? What are some of the statements you might make in the letter? Tell me. Sorry? Who you are? You will tell them who you are. Alright? So you tell them who you are. That is the writer of the letter. Okay. Thank you. So in the letter, you might tell the people, let's say you're sending a letter to, I don't know, Quebec. You might tell them who you are. But remember, you're sending a messenger to them, or an ambassador, let's say. What else might you include in the letter? Introduce the messenger. You will what? Introduce. Exactly. Ahsan. You will introduce your messenger. 
What might you say specifically, though, in introducing your messenger? What are some of the things you might say? Yes, brother. His name. You would say his name. What else might you say? Yes, you. You have your hand up? That means you intend to answer. <laughs> that he's here to help them out? Yes. What else might you say? Yes, brother. His personality. Sorry? His personality. His personality, you know, he's a good guy, whatever. Yes? Last and final message. No, no, we're not talking about the Quran or the Prophet. We're talking about you sending a messenger to Quebec. What might be some of the things you might write in the letter of introduction to the people of Quebec? Yes? Who is he representing? Who he is representing, exactly. The whole idea behind this letter of introduction is to let the people there know who you are, the sender, in the first place. Number two, you, need, you want them to also know who the, who the messenger is and what relationship he has with you, basically representing you. And thirdly, you would make it clear that you expect the people of Quebec to do what in relation to your messenger? They listen to him and follow him. Wouldn't you do that? All right, wouldn't you probably say, look, so-and-so is, you know, an ambassador or my messenger, and I have confidence in him, you know, he's educated, here his credentials, whatever. That's what you would expect in a letter of introduction. Right? If you were writing a recommendation for someone, you'll basically do the same thing. Because you're writing based on your knowledge of that individual. All right, now come back to this scene with the Prophet ﷺ. Here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He decides that it is time to send the final Prophet and Messenger. So he's sending Muhammad as a Messenger to mankind. At the very least, to his people, to start with. He gives him a letter of introduction. That is the revelation. But what does he say in this letter? It has nothing about what you and I talked about just now. Nothing. It does not say Muhammad is a messenger of Allah, so you must believe in him and listen to him. You would expect that if God is going to commission a messenger and send him to the people, that might be the first statement God will tell the people. But look, this man is my messenger. You need to listen to him and obey him. Now mind you, there is a verse like that in the Quran. Allah says, Muhammadun Rasulullah in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, in the Quran. And towards the end, Muhammadun Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. But this is not the first verse, or it's not all of the five, first five verses that Allah revealed. That's, what's in, that, that's one of the interesting things about the revelation. This letter of introduction does not have anything that you and I would expect to find in a letter of introduction. It doesn't talk about that at all. But instead, it talks about something else. That is learning and knowledge, education. First of all, Allah says, Iqra, read. That is, that is sort of a, 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 an implication or a synonymous with learn, educate yourself. Read. And then in these verses as well, mind you, Allah also mentions in, in these five verses, He mentions the two most important methods of learning, reading and writing. You can learn through other ways. You can learn by seeing, you can learn by listening, hearing, you can even learn by feeling. People who are blind and they know Braille, they, they read. The Quran in Braille, for example, they can touch it and they can read. But reading and writing are the two most important as well as common or, or widespread ways and methods of learning. In addition to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes the fact that learning is not only religious but also academic and together what they do is or what they should do is make you a better human being. That's how knowledge, or that's how the Qur'an seeks to remove people from darkness into light. It elevates who you are as a human being. Because remember, the essence of the human being is the intellect that we have. 
The intellect, that's what makes us stand out over everything else. This is what makes us better than animals. Our intellect. And as a result of the intellect, we have been able to invent so many things, mashallah, that make life so, so simple and easy. So many things we've invented that we have gone to the point where we, we are also capable of wiping out our own selves. Of all the creatures in existence, brothers and sisters, human beings are the only ones who have reached a point where they're capable of destroying themselves completely, wipe out every last human being alive. Right? With these nuclear and at atomic bombs. We have that ability. But that's a testament to the intellect that we have. The greatness of the intellect that we have. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has made it clear that when a person does not use this intellect properly, then that person is no better than the animal. That person is even worse than an animal, Allah says. Allah says, In whom illa kal an'am. Nay, they are just like animals. Bal hum adallu sabila. Nay, they are worse than animals. Because the animals have no capacity to behave any, any better. They don't have the intellectual capacity to do so. But the human being has that. So for the human to behave like an animal, in reality that person is worse than the animal because that person is capable of behaving much better. So when the internet is not put to good use, when knowledge does not connect the, cre the creation with the creator, Allah says, look, that is an individual who is just like an animal. Living life, eating and drinking. As Allah says in the Quran, يَأْكُلُونَ وَيَتَمَتَّعُونَ كَمَا تَأْكُلُ الْأَنْعَامُ وَالنَّارُ مَثْوًا لَهُمْ Allah describes the disbelievers, He says, they eat and they enjoy themselves just like animals eat. That's how they live. Just for the sake of enjoyment, that's it. No other objective behind that. But Allah says, however, the fire will be their ultimate destination. So with this first revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces His Prophet to, to mankind on the basis of the value of learning. And one of the implications of this revelation is that, look, people will obviously be skeptical. You mean you're a prophet? How, how can we be sure? But the message of education that the verses give to mankind is in effect saying to mankind, look, don't doubt. Maybe you should do some investigation. Maybe you should check this out. Right? Learn about it. Don't just discount it, but learn about it. Investigate it. And if at the end you find that, that his claims are not true, fine. But what if you find that his claims are true? In fact, anyone who studies the, the Quran can only come out with one conclusion. Any other conclusion, really the person is not telling us the, the truth that they feel. Of course, my son of the Quran say, look, this is not this is not revelation. But that person is lying. Because even the, 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 the people of Quraysh who disbelieved, even they, even they recognized that the Quran was not the words of any human being. They knew this. They openly claimed that the Prophet was learning it from someone else or somewhere else. But in their hearts, they knew. In their hearts and their souls, they knew that this was not the words of Muhammad or any human being. Allah says in the Quran, وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُ They openly denied it, while their souls acknowledged it as the truth. But for many reasons, they didn't bring themselves to openly believe and embrace it. Openly they denied, and they spoke out against it. But Allah says in their hearts, وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ 
their own selves, their own souls, knew and recognized it as the truth. So this is the power of education, brothers and sisters. In fact, in our world today, very often we hear people saying, knowledge is power. <laughs> knowledge is power. The life of a person can only get better with knowledge, nothing else. You can have all the equipments and all the technology in the world. If you don't have the knowledge to use them, it's useless to you. So knowledge is the key. In fact, with the knowledge, you can produce the technology. That's what happened. This is exactly what happened. And so 14 centuries ago, when the idea of learning was unheard of completely in human societies, this was the kind of message that Allah gave to mankind. The industrialized world, brothers and sisters, they call them the G8 nations. You guys have heard of the G8 nations? All right. These are the nations that are supposed to be the rich nations. Nations with a lot of industry and so on. You know what started all of this? It was knowledge and learning. The curiosity of the human mind led people to experiment. And many things were discovered, not deliberately, but by chance. By accident, many things were discovered. And as a result, look at where life is at for human beings today. Today, mashaAllah, you can sit in a plane and within hours travel thousands of kilometers. What you can do in 40 minutes today, it will take you about a week and a half to do it in those days. You can fly from Jeddah to Medina in 40 minutes. 40 minutes. The plane goes up, they bring you a glass of drink, and by the time you're halfway through, the pilots announce, we started our descent into Medina airport. 40 minutes. It took the Prophet ﷺ when he traveled for Hajj, about eight days or nine days to travel from Medina to Mecca, same distance, 400 and about 30 kilometers. And these days we can do it in 40 minutes. In those days it took them eight days at least. A testament to, the, to, 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 the, to what the knowledge can achieve, what education and learning can achieve and bring about. So in these verses, this is the message that Allah chose to give to mankind. That look, even with this, with this new uh, 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 prophet, don't discount him. Check it out. Learn about it first. And then afterwards you can, you can make your decision. We all know that we're not supposed to judge a book unless we read it first. You should not even look at the author and say, oh, don't worry, that book is useless. Before you can truly judge the book, you need to read it. When you read it, then you are in a position now to give judgment. For or against. Even if you disagree, at least you have read it. So you are in a position to say something about this book, good or bad. But if you haven't read it, you are in no position to give any judgment. You should stay quiet. And so with this knowledge, with this uh, concept of knowledge here in these verses, this is basically one of the messages that Allah is giving to mankind. Let your reactions be based on learning, guys. So if you deny, let it be on knowledge. If you accept, let it be because of knowledge, not ignorance. Now, before I move off at this point, I want to highlight the fact, as I mentioned, that in these verses, Allah also teaches us that learning is an, a combination of academic as well as religious. So when Allah says, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, read in the name of your Lord who created, this we can interpret it to mean religious learning. Right? Read in the name of God. As I said, many people, anything that's associated with God is considered religious. And that's why in secular law, they take out everything that mentions God. Do you know right now in, uh, in Canada, uh, in Ontario, for example, in the legislature, they used to recite the Lord's Prayer every morning. You guys know about this? Now they have stopped it. Because they say, look, you know, 
Not everybody's Christian. And so out of respect for those who are not Christians, we shouldn't be reading the Lord's Prayer. So anything with God, they take it out. Say that's religious. We are a secular academic society. No mention of God. So let's assume that. But in the next few verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with an issue that is purely academic. Allah says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ اقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ He created mankind from a leech-like clot or a drop of blood or literally translated something that clings. Alright? And I noticed you have some of these uh, displays here. And in the previous uh, times that I've come, I've noticed that as well. Allah says He created human beings from something that clings or something that is known as a blood clot or a leech-like clot. A clot that looks like a leech, in other words. Some translation says that. Now, what field of scientific knowledge would, would this verse come under? Anybody wants to guess? What would come under? Quranic, uh, 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 religious instruction, hadith, fiqh, what would it come under? Science. What, what specifically branch of science? Sorry, embryology, exactly. Human reproduction, fine. See, we call this academic learning or secular learning. But the Quran says, read in the name of the same God who, did, who created man like this. In other words, we can't separate them, and we shouldn't separate them, brothers and sisters. So Islamic education is not just religious instruction. That's important. But it's only one half. It's only one half. A, 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 an individual is not rounded if he or she has only one half of learning. You're unbalanced. What you need to be is balanced. You need to be balanced. Now when we investigate what Allah really is, then we understand how much biology this is. Because only with the discovery of the microscope and the invention of the microscope were human beings able to see what the fertilized egg looks like after it implants itself to the womb of the mother. The Sahabas could only guess, brothers and sisters, they could only guess. Alaqa means to hang and cling. Like you hang your hat on the wall and it's hanging there. That's all they could understand. But they could not see the shape. They didn't have microscopes in their days. But they believed in it. It was the word of Allah. But today we have the ability not just to believe because it's the word of God. But we have the ability to confirm that it is the word of God. SubhanAllah. Because now we can see what it looks like. And when you look at it, you can see that sometimes it looks like a leech. There is a professor at the University of Toronto named Keith Moore. It is said that some years ago he was invited by some of the scholars in Saudi into Riyadh. And when he arrived there, they said to him, look, you are the expert in your field of embryology. So you know. What, what this is all about. Here is what the Quran has to say about your field of expertise. We would like you to examine this information and tell us what you think. Tell us what you think. And when he began to look at this, the information in the Quran, he was blown away by the precise nature of this information. It doesn't give too much information, the Quran, but whatever it gives, is very precise. In fact, he himself, he is one of the authors who wrote the textbook that is used in the University of Toronto in embryology. When he came back, he went to the Toronto Zoo and he asked them to show him a picture of a leech. 
Because remember the translation says, leech like cloth. When he looked at the picture of a leech, and he looked at a picture of what the egg looks like in, 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 in a day or two after it's, it, it, it implants itself on the womb of the mother, he was amazed at the similarity of the, the description. It looks like a leech indeed. Now all these details you can only get through what? Through the study of biology or embryology. We call it academic, the Quran says, well, this is all part of our knowledge and understanding of Allah the Creator. So we should not separate, but we should combine the two. If also, the, when he came back, the reporters asked him that, you know, maybe the Quraysh were cutting up the... Yeah, and that's also a, a very interesting uh, part of the story. After he did his studies of the Quran, the verses relating to embryology, and he agreed that, look, actually he said, you know what, no man could ever write this. At that time, it, people did not have the knowledge. Impossible. So a reporter, because he held a press conference, a reporter said to him, well, isn't it possible that the Arabs did crude dissections on women and they realized or found out that the, 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 the egg, when it's fertilized, looked like a leech and that's why they, you know, Muhammad wrote it? Isn't it possible that that happened? So he said to the reporter, it did not matter how many dissections the Arabs in those days had done. Even if they had done a million dissections, they could never learn this. Because at that phase of its existence, it is impossible to see it with your naked eye. You must get a microscope. So then he said to the reporter, now you would have to assume that the Arabs also were able to make a microscope and see this, and then effectively destroy the microscope till it was reinvented about 200 years ago. The reporter said, well, no, he, he, he wouldn't uh, agree that that's what happened. That they effectively destroyed their microscope until it was rediscovered, reinvented 200 years ago. So he said, it doesn't matter how many dissections you do at that stage, you simply cannot see it with your eye. Question is, where then, where then did the information come from? If you cannot learn it as a human being because you can't see it, where did the information come from? You can say, well, maybe the prophet guessed. But it's very risky to guess. Because remember, you can guess wrong. And if you're wrong only once, it would be enough to discredit the entire revelation. But this was no guesswork, brothers and sisters. It was revelation from Allah, the exalted, the creator. That's what it is. And that's why there are no mistakes or contradicting information or incorrect information in the Qur'an. And the Qur'an has challenged mankind to look for mistakes or contradictions or discrepancies in correct information. Because if you can find even one case, then that, can, that is enough to prove that the Qur'an is not revelation from God. Because we believe God is perfect. God cannot make mistakes. God does not forget. There is nothing that God does not know. So we expect that his information is flawless and perfect. And up to today, that challenge is, has still gone unanswered by human beings. And it will continue to remain unanswered until the Day of Judgment. For the simple reason that the Quran is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's impossible to ever find any mistakes or incorrect information in it. In the translation, you can have problems. In our understanding of the verse, you can have problems, but not in the Quran and its information itself. We have to stop here because of Salah. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. Inshallah, when we come back, um, we'll probably, uh, I'll probably say a few words more and then we'll uh, deal with some questions. Jazakumullahu khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He cause us to benefit from what we learned and may He teach us what is beneficial to us and may He increase our knowledge so that we can better serve him and worship him.